In the early 1970s, Ugandan politics were simmering with tension and distrust, particularly between President Milton Obote and his army commander, Major General Idi Amin. Suspecting Amin of misappropriating army funds and other misconduct, Obot planned to arrest him, but Amin turned the tables, launching a coup on January 25, Elfu Moja na Mia Tisa Sabini na Moja. While Obot was away at a Commonwealth summit in Singapore, Amin seized control, capturing strategic sites in Kampala and Entebbe. This military takeover would mark the beginning of one of Uganda's darkest periods, as Amin's rule was later characterized by widespread violence and human rights abuses. This essay examines the causes of the 1971 coup, the events that unfolded, and its impact on Uganda and the broader region. Background of tensions between Obot and Amin Milton Obot's rise to power in Uganda began with high hopes for national unity and economic progress. However, his administration soon faced criticism, including allegations of corruption and favoritism. Tensions within the government intensified as Obot moved to centralize power, sidelining political opponents, and rewriting Uganda's constitution in 1967 to give himself greater control. These actions alienated many, particularly those in Uganda's army, which was primarily composed of ethnic groups loyal to different political factions, Idi Amin. An ambitious soldier who had risen through the ranks of the King's African Rifles during Uganda's colonial period. Bekame, a powerful figure within the Ugandan military. Appointed by Obot as deputy commander of the army, Amin was instrumental in enforcing Obot's policies, which often involved brutal measures. However, the relationship between the two soured as Obot grew wary of Amin's influence and military spending, which had been rising sharply. Financial irregularities and allegations of corruption, including the embezzlement of military funds, prompted Obot to plan Amin's arrest. Obot's decision to attend the 1971 Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Singapore presented Amin with an opportunity. Wile Obot sought to strengthen his position on the international stage and campaign against apartheid in South Africa. Amin saw his absence as a chance to secure power for himself. The planned arrest of Amin had set the stage for a showdown, but it would be Amin who struck first, the execution of the coup. As soon as Obot left Uganda, Amin's loyalists moved swiftly to secure strategic locations across Kampala and Entebbe. Army and military police forces loyal to Amin took control of key infrastructure, including Entebbe International Airport, cutting off any possibility of Obot's immediate return. Soldiers loyal to Obot and members of the General Service Unit put up some resistance, but they were largely uncoordinated and disorganized, leaving them vulnerable to Amin's well-prepared forces. Fierce fighting broke out in Kampala, especially around police and military installations. Jinja, a town about 80 kilometers from the capital, saw clashes as well, but the coup forces quickly overwhelmed the defenders. Amin's soldiers blockaded major roads and imposed a nighttime curfew to maintain control. By San Nena Madakika the Lathini Pm, the state-controlled radio announced that the army, under Amin's leadership, had assumed full control of Uganda. The radio broadcasts accused Obot's government of widespread corruption, claiming that his policies fueled violence and unrest. Furthermore, they alleged that Obot's administration had given preferential treatment to certain regions and ethnic groups, exacerbating internal divisions. The broadcasts framed the coup as a necessary action by the military to restore stability. A message that was met with cheers by crowds in Kampala who hoped that Amin might bring about positive change, the role of international influences and British allegations in the aftermath of the coup. Suspicions arose about possible international involvement, especially from the British government. Obot's policies had increasingly diverged from Western interests, as he was a vocal supporter of independence movements across Africa and had opposed Britain's plans to sell arms to apartheid South Africa. Some scholars speculate that Britain may have indirectly supported Amin's coup to protect its interests in Uganda and the broader region. However, the evidence for British involvement remains largely circumstantial, with accusations relying on questionable sources and later actions of the British Foreign Office. Nonetheless, the perception of possible British collusion fueled widespread distrust in Uganda's former colonial rulers and underscored the broader geopolitical implications of Amin's rise.
Britain quickly recognized Amin's government, reinforcing suspicions of indirect support. Whether or not the British government played a role, Amin's alignment with Western interests in the initial stages of his rule helped to secure international legitimacy. Immediate aftermath and Amin's consolidation of power following the coup, Amin quickly moved to consolidate his power and eliminate potential threats. One of his first actions was to purge the military of soldiers from Obot's ethnic group, the Langi and their Ikoli allies. Within a year, approximately 5,000 soldiers and civilians from these groups had been killed or disappeared under Amin's orders. These purges marked the beginning of a brutal campaign to secure his authority, as Amin sought to root out any potential dissent within the army and government. Amin also used his new position to expel foreign influences that he deemed unfavorable. He launched widespread expulsions of Asian Ugandans, particularly those of Indian descent, seizing their businesses and properties and distributing them to his loyalists. This move, which Amin justified as a means to return the wealth to native Ugandans, significantly disrupted the economy and created long-lasting damage to Uganda's financial sector. In reality, the expulsion served as a mechanism for Amin to reward his supporters and cement his power. The impact on Uganda and the region, Amin's rule soon descended into an era of terror for Uganda, marked by countless human rights abuses and the indiscriminate killing of perceived enemies. His regime became notorious for its violent suppression of dissent, with estimates suggesting that up to 300,000 Ugandans were murdered under his orders. Victims included political rivals, intellectuals, and members of ethnic groups whom Amin suspected of disloyalty. Detention centers like the State Research Bureau in Nakasero became infamous for their brutal torture methods and inhumane conditions. As thousands fled the country to escape Amin's repression, a large Ugandan diaspora formed in neighboring Tanzania. Supported by Tanzanian President Julius Nyeri. These exiles organized a guerrilla force, intent on overthrowing Amin and restoring Uganda's former government. In Elfu Moja na Mia Tisa Sabini Nambili, this group launched an invasion of Uganda, hoping to incite a popular uprising against Amin. However, the invasion failed to gain traction, and Amin's forces quickly quashed the rebellion. The defeat soured relations between Uganda and Tanzania, sowing the seeds for future conflict. The Uganda-Tanzania War and the fall of Idi Amin, the strained relations between Uganda and Tanzania eventually led to the Uganda-Tanzania War, which would culminate in the toppling of Amin's regime. In Elfu Moja na Mia Tisa Sabini na Nane, Amin launched an unprovoked invasion of Tanzania, intending to annex part of the Kogera region. Tanzania responded with a full-scale counter-invasion, backed by Ugandan exiles who saw an opportunity to remove Amin from power. In April 1979, Tanzanian forces, alongside Ugandan rebels, captured Kampala, effectively ending Amin's brutal reign. With Amin's fall, Uganda faced the daunting task of rebuilding a nation shattered by nearly a decade of authoritarian rule. The years of violence had devastated Uganda's economy, dismantled its infrastructure, and instilled fear and distrust among its people. The overthrow of Amin was celebrated as a liberation. But the wounds of his rule would take years to heal. Conclusion, the coup that ousted Milton Obote and propelled Idi Amin to power in 1971 was a turning point in Ugandan history, one marked by betrayal, violence, and international intrigue. What began as a move by Obot to contain Amin's ambitions ended in a takeover that would lead to one of the most infamous dictatorships in Africa. Amin's initial popularity quickly dissipated as he embarked on a reign of terror, purging rivals, massacring ethnic groups, and plunging Uganda into a period of fear and repression. The long-term impact of Amin's rule is a sobering reminder of how power, once seized, can be wielded with cruelty and impunity. His actions strained Uganda's relationships with neighboring countries, particularly Tanzania, which played a pivotal role in his eventual overthrow. Uganda's journey after Amin has been marked by efforts to heal and rebuild, with memories of his reign serving as a cautionary tale, Amin's story, and the coup that brought him to power. Illustrate the dangers of unchecked ambition and the devastating impact of dictatorial rule. His legacy continues to cast a shadow over Uganda, a stark reminder of the nation's resilience in the face of tyranny and its enduring struggle for peace and justice.